Good afternoon. Hope you're all well. Hope you're doing fine. It's a Sunday afternoon in North London. So there's only one thing that's appropriate to do in this circumstance. And that's go hunting for the Highgate vampire. Yes, we're gonna go to Highgate Cemetery. This place here, actually, I was just filming this for a cutaway. It's very intriguing, it's all this Gothic architecture. It's called Holy Village. Sorry, I'm in your way. I have no idea what it is, by the way, I'm just... <laughs> in the late 1960s, Highgate got gripped by vampire fever. At that time, a number of people came forward saying that they had been attacked by a vampire around this area. Two competing vampire slayers came to the fore to try and track down this terrible vampire that was haunting Highgate. And they tracked the vampire to the cemetery. Turned out the vampire wasn't located in the cemetery, but this grew over a number of years and people became completely convinced that it was real, that there was actually a vampire stalking the streets of Highgate. It became known as the Highgate Vampire. One of the vampire slayers claims to have finally slain the vampire in a house down in Hornsey at the bottom of the hill here, driving a wooden stake through his heart. I think that was a guy called Sean Manchester. I might have that completely wrong. The two vampire slayers were David Farrant and Sean Manchester. I've read David Farrant's book, uh, which is really entertaining read actually. And it's a fantastic bit of North London folklore. Of course, they're all good legends and kind of shaggy dog stories have their origins in some real circumstances. And the real circumstance here at that period of time was how neglected and derelict Highgate Cemetery had become. A lot of the tombs were open, there were bones scattered around. Um, people would take skulls out. And of course, I think people were doing sort of a, in inverted commas, satanic rituals up here. It was quite a wild place. I do love the story of the Highgate Vampire. Look at these amazing flats here. You have to get a ticket to come in to Highgate Cemetery. It's £4.50 just for the east side, this side. And I think it's a tenner for both, east and west. This is the more modern one. Well, I say more modern, I think this is the one that's still in use. And this side, the east side is famous for being the site of the Marx Memorial, the Karl Marx Memorial. Literally one of the first graves I see. It's one of my favorite musicians. Bert Jansch, fantastic guitarist. And uh, I love the fact that the gift shop there is full of various bits of Karl Marx uh, merchandise, because most of which is sold out. Highgate Cemetery dates from um, 1839 and it was built in response to a crisis actually across all big European cities when by the early 1800s because of urban expansion all the kind of uh, churchyards which is where people were buried before you were buried near the parish church they were all full up and this was leading to some really big problems because cities were continuing to go really really fast. So it was left in private hands to come up to a solution. And so these kind of garden cemeteries were built. Famously, you've got the Pierre Lachaise Cemetery in Paris. And in London, the first of these was, um, was Kensal Green Cemetery. And that led to the formation of the uh, London Cemetery Company, who were commissioned by Parliament to build cemeteries northward, southward and eastward, Kensal Green being the westward one. These today are known as the Magnificent Seven. And the first two others that they built, the northward one here 
Highgate 1839 and the Southwood one at Nunhead. And the idea was that Nunhead and Highgate were both built on slopes facing each other across the London Basin with the idea being that you could see between the two of them on a clear day with St Paul's Cathedral right in the middle. I mean, I don't know if you can see Nunhead from here. I was in Nunhead Cemetery a few months ago. And it does have incredible views of St Paul's. Corin Redgrave, the actor, member of the famous Redgrave acting dynasty. Jim Stanford Horn, must admit I've never heard of him. I have to look him up afterwards, but he is on the map. And then somewhere after this is Adams, which I'm hoping is Douglas Adams, right? I don't know what it was that made me realise that this was going to be Douglas Adams's tombstone, or headstone, I should say, with the pot of pens beneath it. Isn't that delightful? The great Douglas Adams, 1952 to 2001. Somebody in the comments will be able to tell me the significance of this kind of very dark grey headstone here. It must have a meaning. A lot of the magnificent seven cemeteries had fallen into disrepair in the 20th century, sort of in the latter half of the 20th century, which is a real shame, but now they're really treasured. They've all been sort of done up. A lot of them have become nature reserves and they're I hear Highgate is a very popular tourist destination. See how many of the Magnificent Seven you can name off the top of your head? I'm going to do it now. So we've got Kensal Green, obviously. Kensal Green, Highgate, Nunhead, that's three. Tower Hamlets, four. Um, Abney Park, five. <sighs> the other two, the other two, the other two. Ah, Brompton? Brompton? Is Brompton one of the Magnificent Seven? It should be, in which case that's six. I have a feeling that Brompton might not be one of the Magnificent Seven. And now I'm struggling for the seventh, if Brompton is one of the six. I'm also slightly distracted because I'm looking for the tomb of Edward Elgar, which is here somewhere. I think I've missed it, so I can see marks up ahead. And here he is, the star attraction of Highgate Cemetery, Karl Marx. I think this is a, a, a newish monument to Marx. They would not have been able to afford such a grand tombstone the time of his death. What does it say here? Workers of all lands unite. But below the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. Quite a radical idea in his time, which is not actually that long ago, really, in the time arc of history. Next to Marx, you have the tombstone of Claudia Vera Jones, born in Trinidad in 1915, died in London in 1964, who valiant fight against racism and imperialism, who dedicated her life to the progress of socialism and the liberation of her own black people. This is actually quite funny here. You have Chris Harmon and Paul Foote buried facing the Marx Memorial. And I believe they were both members of the Socialist Workers' Party. Chris Harmon here, it says, revolutionary thinker and activist, and Paul Foote, writer and revolutionary. Paul Foote used to actually write for the Daily Mirror, I believe. So it's quite unusual for a, for a revolutionary to have a column in a national newspaper. This has caught my eye. I have no idea who this guy is. Mansour Hekmat. Zubin Razant, 1951 to 2002, to a great man of essence of our lives, the pole star of my existence, the love of my life. Some other interesting headstones here. Something really peaceful in the way that these cemeteries have become like woodlands now, with the tombstones amongst the undergrowth. There's something quite natural about it all. And these places are places of, of life, of growth now, as much as they are or more than they are about death. Death was a big part of Victorian life. Sounds um, 
slightly odd thing to say, but even if you look at infant mortality rates in Victoria and London, they were astonishingly high. I think it was something like 57% of kids died before the age of five, which is terrible. And the average lifespan for a, an upper or middle class male was something like 44 average lifespan. So you have to take into account all those people that are dying in, in, uh, in childhood. For a, for a working class person and a labourer, it was something in the, in the mid twenties between like 22, 24, 25. So it makes a lot more sense of the kind of grandeur and ritual and symbolism that they gave to death when you look how present it would have been in people's lives. A little bit of the hunt to find the original Mark's grave. Oh, here it is. So you can see the difference to the kind of grave he had when he died to that that was built subsequently. At the peak of the Highgate vampire frenzy, there was a point when both the competing vampire slayers said they were going to perform an exorcism or they were going to do something to kind of uh, raise the vampire and kill it here in Highgate Cemetery. They thought they'd traced it back to a particular tomb that was cracked open. And they put the word out, or well, word got around, and it got to such an extent that thousands of people formed a perimeter around Highgate Cemetery. This is in the early 70s. And news crews were here. I think it was even live on ITV or ITN. It was covered by the news. The international media came to London to cover this vampire slaying event. It's incredible, isn't it? And that's, <laughs> that's before the, uh, the days of Twilight and all that business and Harry Potter. I suppose there was a kind of obsession with the, uh, the supernatural in the 60s. You had all those amazing kind of horror films that dealt with those things, didn't you? The next uh, grave I want to find is that of Malcolm McLaren. And there's one here also marked Beck, which I'm hoping is Harry Beck designer of the London tube map. And here he is, the great music impresario and well, an adopter of situationist ideas and sometimes psychogeographer Malcolm McLaren. Could you call him the godfather of punk? Controversially, I'm gonna stick my neck out and say that. People will correct me in the comments, but certainly left a massive impact on culture. Well, this is a curious monument. I can't see any, any inscription on it at all, anything saying what it is. There's a bench here and just a plain slab. This is very curious. Is this the final resting place of Stanley Kubrick? As ever, I, uh, I got here quite late and the gates are locked at five o'clock. I think they're ringing a bell to let you know. I don't want to get locked in Highgate Cemetery because I'm not so sure that they did stake the Highgate vampire back in 1972. He might still be stalking the cemetery grounds. Someone clearly had a sense of both design and humour when designing this tombstone. It just says, dead. Who's that? I can't actually read the name. And right next to the cemetery, we have the wonderful Waterloo Park. I haven't been here for years actually. It's a really lovely park, Waterloo Park in Highgate. Waterloo Park is another example of a London park formed from the gardens of some grand houses. In this instance, there were five houses whose gardens formed this park. I mean, Highgate is ridiculously high up <laughs> to the extent that when 
I uh, walk through Highgate Village in the past and they get gaps between the houses where you can see down in the city. It kind of triggers my vertigo a little bit in places and that's uh, no exaggeration, however pathetic that may, that may sound. And perhaps we'll take a, a walk through Highgate Village so you can maybe get a sense of that. But it's very high up and that kind of, I suppose, defined its history for a long time because it's where in the past, in sort of medieval and early modern London, this is where wealthy people came to get away from the pestilence and the disease of the city. It's interesting that there used to be malaria in London at one point. That is crazy as that sounds. I believe that's what Oliver Cromwell died of. He died of malaria. So the wealthy people would come to the high ground around places like Highgate and like Hampstead to get away from, <laughs> from the kind of boggy marshes below. I could see it on the map, but it didn't quite make sense to me. It's fantastic. This is the home of the Lux, the wonderful artist film organisation, which used to be in Hoxton Square, and then it was in uh, Shacklewell Lane. And it appears to now be here in Waterloo Park. What's under the lungs? So-called archive. I have to come and check that out. Fantastic organisation, the Lux. Take a look at their website. So here's a map of the park. We're here. I think we should go via Lauderdale House and come out at Highgate High Street. I think we should go for a look at Lauderdale House. So this is interesting. The original Lauderdale House was built in 1582 for uh, one of the Lord Mayors of London, a guy called Richard Martin. I very much doubt that any of that building survives within this shell, but who knows? I think today it's like an art centre and cafe and stuff. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. When you get close up, you can see how there might be a timber frame beneath all of this. So this is Sir Sidney Waterlow, who uh, donated the park to the people of London in 1889. It's a fantastic view down across the London Basin here. You can see the shard there, poking out from beside the Thames. That was, uh, it was really lovely as I stopped to look at the statue of, of Waterloo. I already forgot his first name. Was it Sydney Waterloo? These two old ladies were walking past behind me and they went, ah, I wonder how he made his money, the old Waterloo. Must have made a lot of money. <laughs> that's, that's always the question, isn't it now? You got to think, well, what did this character get up to? You know, oh, he's remembered for donating this park to the people. What a great guy. You think, yeah, but hang on a moment. He was, how did he make that incredible wealth? And if he inherited it, what did his ancestors get up to? <laughs> I mean, philanthropy doesn't pay, does it? <laughs> it is money doing something. I love the atmosphere of a London park on a Sunday afternoon. You see all sorts of little things. Some people just sitting on their own on a bench reading a book. Couples having a cuddle and a picnic. Families out playing, people walking their dogs, people playing sport. All sorts of stuff. Highgate High Street. I just feel that Highgate's better either late on a summer's evening or on a, or on a winter's afternoon when it's all lit up and cosy. It's kind of like heavy cloud, sort of half five on a Sunday in late summer, early autumn. It's not at its best in this weather. Highgate Bookshop. What have they got in their window? Obviously, got some good local history there. Highgate gets its name from the 13th century gate 
that led to Hornsey Park. Obviously that 30th century gate is long gone. The thing that really defines Highgate is its, is its altitude. Look at this little lovely little muse place behind me there. Is its altitude and it kind of cut it off from the rest of London in the past. It's quite a steep hill to climb. So if you're doing that on foot or by horse and car or horse and carriage, it'd be quite a climb. What I love is that the fella who laid the cable car system in San Francisco also created a cable system linking Highgate to Archway. But apparently that was blighted by um, mechanical problems and disrepair and so it was never really never really took off but that's an amazing idea isn't it there's a cable car system like the San Francisco ones running down the hill here it's got a real magic to it though Highgate Village it's really quite a delightful place and this was quite a notable institution in its day a Highgate Literary and Scientific Institution from 1839 you occasionally come across pamphlets and books that they've published in the past. I think they still exist. And Swain's Lane here is the old lane that runs down past Highgate Cemetery. That's a really atmospheric place at night. And the rather splendid Pond Square Chapel. What a majestic beast of a building this is. Pond Square which feels slightly misnamed because there's no pond here anymore. My favourite little story about Pond Square is that this is where Francis Bacon, who was a famous essayist from the early 17th century and he was Lord Chancellor, he uh, died of pneumonia when trying to refrigerate a chicken in Pond Square. Yeah, I mean, that's a really silly way to die, right? Even in the early 17th century. So following on from the Highgate Vampire, the Gatehouse pub here is famously haunted. Apparently many a traveller staying here would encounter the ghost during the night. Uh, it was a gatehouse for coach travellers heading in and out of London. I had a drink in there one uh, Christmas. Actually, I had a drink in there two Christmases and it really does retain a kind of wonderfully wonderfully ghostly feel, not a scary ghostly feel, but a benign ghostly chill to it. I think this is the prestigious Highgate School with many a famous student among its alumni. On this, on Hampstead Lane here, we have the Gatehouse Theatre. This is a lovely little independent theatre. I feel like I went there to see a play many years ago. 20 odd, 20 plus, what, 23, 22 years ago, 24 years ago, 20 odd years ago, I used to put on shows on the London Fringe, various venues ranging from, I think the biggest one was probably the Riverside Studios, quite a prestigious venue, down to all sorts of places really. And a lot of them were rooms above pub, theatres above pubs, like the, there's the, the Hen and Chickens on Highbury Corner, and you have the wonderful King's Head Theatre pub. And uh, that is a really wonderful side to London. We're very fortunate. I think you can take it for granted that we have all these amazing little theatre spaces that are, well, they were affordable enough for me to, to hire and put on shows there. It's a really great side to London life. One that I should uh, get back into as a punter, as going along to watch stuff, support people, putting on shows in these great little, little spaces that sometimes only seat maybe 50, 50 people. Right, we're looking for the Grove. Here it is. This is uh, where, this is where uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge lived down here. So number three, the Grove, was once the home of J.B. Priestley and also Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. I thought he lived at number three, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner and all that. Apparently when he lived in Highgate, he just stayed at home the whole time, except to come out and sit on Highgate Hill and look down at the smoggy city below. And here we have the Flask Pub, dating from 1663, would you believe? And apparently they have a very curious uh, traditional custom here called the swearing of the horns, where the landlord of the pub holds a pair of 
antler horns in front of the drinker and they must then swear an oath on it, after which they are granted the freedom of Highgate. I wonder if they're still doing it. St Michael's Church, Highgate, which is actually grade two listed, even though it only dates from the 1830s. But it's listed because of, uh, it includes the work of three leading architects of the Gothic Revival and is considered to be a particularly ambitious parish church. Well, herein ends our walk in the northern heights of Highgate. Get a bit dizzy from the altitude. I'm just going to walk down West Hill now to get the train back east from Gospel Oak. What a delightful stroll through Highgate. Thank you so much for joining me. I know it was sort of like a kind of like a taster, if you like, for the history of Highgate. Not in any means completely comprehensive. I've got a whole book at home, well, like a big chunk of a massive book at home about the Northern Heights written by William Howard in the 19th century. There's loads of stuff about Highgate. So this is just a, a skim across. It wasn't great to go. I've never, been, I've never been to Highgate Cemetery before. There you go. Let the shock sink in of that. Never been there before. Walked past it many times. Never actually been in. So uh, it was a great day for me. I really enjoyed that. I hope you're keeping well. And as I always like to say, I look forward to seeing you on the next walk wherever that may be. And at this point, really, I am just making it up week to week. I don't know where I'll be next week. Who knows, I might not be in London. You never know. I may well be in London. I mean, I could be literally, I won't say I could be anywhere. I'm not Jeff Bezos, I'm not about to go into space or anything like that, but 